All right. We are live. So let's wait for everyone to come in. Join the party. Let me see if I can just invite him. Huh? What's up? What's up? Welcome, guys. We're just about to start the interview. Hey, nice. You got on quick. Hey, hey, hey. How's it going? Pretty good, man. Good. So I did have a question. How do I pronounce your name? It is pronounced Cultus. Cultus. That's the one. Cool. Okay. Okay. I, I was like, yeah. I'm not even gonna try. I'm just gonna ask. <laughs> You're lucky. Normally, I make people try at least once. It's uh, <laughs> it's, ger it's German, and it means culture. Culture. Okay. So so Cultus. Cultus. Okay. If yeah. I butcher it during it, I'm I, I definitely apologize. <laughs> It's all right, mate. You're all uh -oh. good. No, dude, I, the accent. Oh, man, that's awesome. I'm digging the accent. <laughs> man, I thought you, uh, thought, thought, thought you and your fans would enjoy the uh, the Ocker Aussie accent. Yeah. It's quite, quite extensive, yeah. You don't expect it with the name either. Kind of blows people away normally. Yeah, I don't know why. I thought you were in the UK. And then I, I went and I, I saw you did the tag. And I was like, oh, he's actually in uh, Perth, Australia. Yeah, that's right. Down under, huh? That's the one. Nice, nice. We're all yeah. upside down. Yeah. So let's just uh, let, let it fill up for a minute and kind of just um, cover some quick stuff. So, um, so what? That, are you from Australia? Yeah, born and bred in Australia. I uh, grew up in a place called Noble Park in Victoria. Uh, it's in the uh, southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And uh, from 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 there, I uh, I uh, left home when I was twelve, due to things being pretty bad, and went and lived out in the bush by myself. Lived in a rusted out old combi van on twenty acres of land, and I used to cook my food on an open fire and drink the damn water and kept myself alive that way. And just kept myself away from humanity and doing my own little thing and finding my own self. Wow, now. Wow. Yeah. So, because what I've noticed about Australia, you'll have to kind of um, tell me if I'm right or wrong. There's a lot of like just nothing. And then you have a few major cities on like the coast, right? Yeah, right. So the, the bulk of the center of Australia is all desert and pretty much uninhabitable unless you're like, just, you know, enjoy that kind of thing. Most of us don't. Um, and, and the rest of our cities are kind of scattered on the, uh, on the southern, southern coast up to, uh, if you're going to the west coast, like, like Perth, Perth and a little bit above Perth, that's it. There's, there's, there's nothing much else. There's, there's a few towns and that whatnot. It's quite sparse up that way. Um, going around the other way, where um, a few blank spaces, you've got uh, South Australia, which has the uh, capital city of Adelaide, and a few cities, a uh, few suburbs and that around that, a few little, few little towns pocketed around and whatnot, quite, quite, quite a lot, but condensed into a, in, in, into a reasonable area. And then as you travel further east, you've got Melbourne, which Victoria is pretty much packed out. It's, it's all little towns and there's, there's all kinds of industry and mines and things going on throughout, throughout the state. And as you go up, go up north on the east, on the east coast, you've got Sydney and Canberra and all, all of, all of New South Wales is, is again quite, quite, quite like Victoria, very much, uh, you know, little pockets of towns everywhere and, and lots of little industry through them. And then you've got Queensland, which again becomes a little bit more sparse, but still quite populated and, and, and quite a few towns throughout. But as you get further up to the very top of Queensland, you get into what's known as Arnhem Land, which is the, uh, the Aboriginal lands. Mm -hmm. So they're still like, they still live up there and, and, and do, do their thing up there. And you've actually got to have like permits to go up into these regions and they're alcohol free and stuff like that. Um, and then you've got, as you come, come across the top, you've got the Northern Territory and that's the one where there is nothing. There's Darwin and there is Alice Springs and then it is just, Hundreds of kilometers between farms that like like uh, cattle stations. Wow! Yeah. So yeah, yeah we have a uh, uh, Trista. She's in here. She's always adds to the conversation. Awesome. And she she was saying much like Canada, 
except cold. So <laughs> a lot of land <laughs> kind of pulling. Well, we're pulling both from the Commonwealth. <laughs> well, we've got no maple syrup here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but you got marsupials. <laughs> lots and lots of marsupials. And uh, I, I actually just learned recently that uh, we have uh, some of the most biodiverse um, uh, predatorial plants, such as, uh, you know, your Venus flytrap type, type plants, as, as oh. anywhere else, in, even including Europe. We have some locations here that have more of those kinds of bug eating plants than anywhere else. And that sort of goes hand in hand with the whole culture of everything's out to kill you in Australia. Right. That's yeah. not. I had no idea. I always kind of. And look to clear it up, flop bears aren't real. Yeah. I always wonder where Venus flytraps and all those come from. I never. Seeing something like that in the wild would be super rad. Um, and yeah, I was actually going through some of my photographs last night and realized that I had taken some photos of one and never even noticed that that's what it was. And as my education grows through these kinds of subjects, I've, I've learned to spot it. And I'm like, oh, hang on. That's a carnivorous plant. Oh, hello. I took a photo of that like two months ago and, and didn't even realize. So, you know, I was just taking like uh, macro shots of tiny plants on the ground because we've got a lot of like, a lot of these really like micro plants that you would just walk over and not even notice. And as I look back through the photos, you can see a little tendrils of a little sap on the end to attract the flies and everything. And yeah, I was pretty amazed that I'd missed that myself. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Nature, man. You, once you start learning about that stuff, you kind of, it opens your eyes to just whatever is like around you and everything, which is exactly yeah. cool. So um, we're going to get into it. Like I, I usually give the, the whole spiel, you know, this is the um, art. <laughs> this is the art, um, art pop interview. And I really, I, I used to do podcasts and the whole podcast format. I, I get it and I do understand the value because people like to take it and listen on their time. But I wanted this to be less of a podcast type interview thing and more of a community um, conversation and also artists helping artists or giving ideas and kind of. So I want it to be live specifically, which I know is hard because everyone's on their own time. But uh, we, I do leave this up for you know, 18 hours or a day after it's posted and then kind of take it away. Cause I really want it to be a special thing. And so if anyone's watching, um, and, and I'll say this a bunch throughout the interview as people come and come and go, but if anyone's listening, if you guys want to ask questions or just uh, add a funny comment, like Trista always does talking about the Venus fly traps made by Elon Musk. <laughs> um, it, it's always, <laughs> it's always good. And yeah, don't worry. I'll, I'll get, I'll get all the uh, fun comments and stuff. So if anyone wants to add any comments or questions, I, that's highly encouraged because a lot of the times, actually most of these interviews, some of the best questions have come from um, the people watching. Because uh, as amazing of an interviewer I am, you know, I, I always miss stuff. So I love whenever anyone adds stuff. So um, definitely do that. And then one more thing, uh, there there is kind of like a um, a trigger warning I did want to add uh, before going into this that we're going to be talking about really sensitive subject matter. Um, so about uh, so if if you're sexually triggering and um uh you know traumatic triggering or ptsd so if anyone has any issues with that definitely i want you to know and just kind of put that out there before we get get going into um the more heavier subjects and whatnot um but as we were kind of talking about on the dms before this is a really deep subject it's something that was very vulnerable in your life and really affected you deeply and going forward and you feel comfortable enough talking about this and expressing it and some people have experienced stuff like that and they're not okay with talking about it and they still are dealing with it so you said you're in a good place now which is awesome to hear but some people aren't in a good place so it's really really awesome that you're able to talk about it and bring this out to the forefront so maybe it can help other people heal or teach them to use some sort of coping mechanism going forward exactly that's what we hope yeah well we're gonna start a little lighter and then we'll we'll get into it and like i said i might have to if if more people hop in i might have to do another trigger warning just to just because i don't we don't want to you know get, you know cause any ptsd or something so i first we kind, yeah we kind of got met 
last, I think it was a week or two ago, you were in one of the live streams. We were talking about stuff, and um, you post a bunch of poetry and writing. So let's get into that first. Um, when did you really start posting your writing? When did you start writing and then posting it online? Right. So this was a little interesting for me because I, uh, I, this was going back about 18 months ago. I actually started to post my works online, but I'd done a very good job of keeping it away from my personal life and my friends and that because of the depth, because of the stories I was telling through my poetry. Um, I didn't know how people would accept me, how people would take me, if I would, you know, further push people away in my life or how that would come across. So I spent 12 months. I, I paid for a bit of advertisement on Facebook. I pushed it out there. I, I, I got a lot of, a lot of good feedback and, and people were very encouraged. Only, only one person came along to give me a hard time, but that was that, that was also handy because I used that as a, you know, I kind of pointed out that you're the reason why my page is here. So <laughs> this is the reason why I write poetry, bully. Off you go. Like, you don't have a place here. Um, and then from there, um, I started actually doing uh, what's called transpersonal art therapy. And I do that with a lady here in Perth called Sarah Wade. She's, she's an incredible healer. Um, I'd never been able to get past my own traumas, get into my own subconscious and, and deal with these things. And uh, through through her and some other encouraging people telling me how good my poetry was, I was sort of like, oh, well, maybe we're coming to a time now where I should share this with my with the people around me. So I sort of checked in with a couple of my closest closest people and they all sort of said, well, yeah, you know, you do your poetry is fantastic, you know, like it's got good stories and then there's a, a lot of content there that would benefit others. Mm -hmm. And that sort of went hand in hand with comments that I'd been getting on the page, which was, you know, oh, you know, wow, I, I really needed to read this today. You know, this is this has really helped me move past something or comments along those lines. And they were really, you know, they were really encouraging. And so I then came forward and posted my, like posted my, my page to my friends and uh, from there, I've just gone in leaps and bounds. I, I joined uh, the Facebook Poetry Society, which is a group on Facebook, and they they do an, they do an incredible job with that group, um, making sure that everyone has a. As I was speaking last time we spoke, I said, "Art is art. No one's no one's got a place to tell you whether your art is acceptable or not." And I actually have earned myself a place as one of the admins in that group because of this attitude. And work very hard along with the rest of them to make sure that everyone has that platform. Um, and that was a massive encouragement encouragement for me. I, on the day that I got offered that was the same day that uh, I had my uh, I had a one-on-one -on -one session with my arts therapist, and it all just sort of synced in where I just woke up to myself and went, "Wow, this is you know, this really is me." So from there. Um, yeah, I've just grown in leaps and bounds and becoming more and more encouraged to, to do more and more poetry. And I have, I, th I think I've evolved a lot with my poetry from if you go on to uh, my page, and that's uh, my meandering experiences. Uh, if you do go onto my page and take a look, some of my earlier works are kind of a bit messy and, and, and the structure's maybe not so good. And then as you get further up the page into the more recent poetry, you see that like I've learned how to structure my poetry and the flow has become a lot better. So yeah that's, but that's and that i've actually been talking to a few people about this perfectionism issue a lot of people don't want to post their art because they feel that they're not at that level that you exactly have right now which is so important to uh just get it out there and then that's how you're gonna grow um bigger so i before we move on though i keep hearing you talking about this art therapy can you kind of yeah. elaborate on this it sounds fascinating yeah, um, so Sarah has um, an extensive uh, education in all forms of different therapies, and she has uh, coupled together basically all her understandings and made her own uh, way of, um, what's the word I'm looking for here, her, her, her own sort of way of, way of counselling people. And we sit down and... 
it's quite interesting. One of the first things we do on every session is we'll sit there and just play with Play-Doh and, and, and just squeeze it in your hands, you know. And, and from that, as she's talking, your subconscious just seems to open up. And before you know it, you're like creating things and you're building things and then you don't even know what you really made and you sort of reflect back on them. You're like, oh, crap, that's what I've made. Like that pertains to this story in my life. Like, and you don't mean to do it. Like, you haven't consciously done anything. You've just, it's like a, almost like art meditation. Mm-hmm. I just don't know how to explain it. <laughs> There's an exercise that I've tried before and done before. It's like the free write where you just, I, I don't know if you're familiar, you just kind of just write where you don't think uh, and you just let your hand. Yeah, it's a very zen sort of thing. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cool. So we actually, Trista has a great question. Do you, so do you find writing to be cathartic or more explaining like where you are when you write? Um, definitely, definitely more explaining where I am, mm-hmm. uh, where I am and where I've been, I suppose. Right. Um, some of the stuff is, is, is older stuff that, that I'm trying to get out. But most of my works is sort of more current tense and how I'm feeling now. That's, that's right. what I've sort of fall, fallen into. But, Again, if I'm sort of triggered by something, like a breakdown in a relationship or, you know, something bad happening at work or something like that, I may well write a poem that is current tense but has a big connection to my past. So a lot of that will come out in that poem as well. Wow, it's powerful because it's so – that's very powerful because when you're triggered, there's something – going on something triggered it so most ptsd and most issues are people just suppress suppress that emotion um yeah you're able to be triggered and recognize it and actually know what triggered you and then be able to write about it i i I mean i believe that's kind of the road or the path to healing i mean would you agree exactly okay yeah It, it, it It is it is my tool for healing. That's what it became. Um, I'm actually a huge fan of Shane Coyzan, if you're familiar with him. No. He's quite a famous he's quite a famous poet. You can check him out on, on, on YouTube. Um and his works are my inspiration, basically. Um I heard his poetry about ten or so years ago. Uh he's a Canadian poet and he um he ended up on Australian morning T V. You know, the good morning sort of programs. Okay, right. And uh, I overheard a poem which was all about bullying. And my my life at school was absolutely and utterly fraught with, with, with bullying at school. And this, this poem just brought me to absolute tears. And I went on to go discover that he had a lot more poetry. And it's all very, very um, reflective sort of poetry for, for people like us to listen to. And it will really open your mind to where you're at, where you've been, how it should and shouldn't affect you, things like that. And through figuring out, like, it was his healing process, I sort of developed it into my healing process as well. It, it, it wasn't always easy. And, and as you see, some of my poetry is quite scattered and messy. But that's a <laughs> Yeah, but that, that's, isn't that how life is, though? Scattered and messy, right? Exactly. It almost goes hand in hand with the poem. Yeah, but it's yeah. almost meant to be scattered and a, and a whole heap of mess. And they're all intended that eventually I'll do them into spoken word. So some of them are they're written in a way that pretty much only I'll get the phonetics right when I when I talk about it because there's certain you know points of points of anger, points of depression, parts in there where they've got to be spoken a little bit quicker or such. You know, there's, there's there's going to be a particular way of, of reading back those scattered scattered messy poems to, to get them across. So as time goes on, I'll, I'll find the time to memorise them properly so that I can do that and we'll, we'll move forward with that as a project for sure, so I, which I've started I, to do now, actually, but yeah. I forgot exactly the words you said. I, I, I wanted to ask it, though, but I might butcher it a little bit. Um, You said something about uh healing healing and then kind of like like not you know not re-triggering re-triggering yourself so how do you find that balance in writing or even any type of art creation that someone's going to try to do healing 
how do you find that balance of healing and expressing yourself and trying to you know uh heal but not re-trigger yourself and going down that dark spiral do, do, does that make sense how do you find it that does, it does it does but um the the actual answer is sometimes i can't sometimes writing the poem is triggering there is one there about um my ex-fiance and when i came out to find her peeled out on the on the lounge room floor after taking a, a huge amount of, 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 of tablets and uh, she tried to kill herself and um I wasn't the greatest human being back then. I kind of still hold a lot of blame for myself in that situation. Um, there was a lot of other things going on in her life at the time. It wasn't just me, but I certainly contributed to it. And uh, writing that poem, um, you'll probably, if you if you find that poem and read it, you'll see the first half of it is written fairly well and the second half of it falls apart and it's because I couldn't read the first half over again to start writing it again. I literally couldn't. And it took me a long time to complete that poem. And when I did, it still took me a long time to let my subconscious heal from it. Um, so, yeah, sometimes sometimes I can't. Um, there's one there about my mother when she, um, when I was in my, later, in my later teens and told her that I'd been, been um, molested as a, a, as a younger child. Um, and she turned around and said to me, well, you probably deserved it. And that poem was exceptionally hard to write without aggression behind it. Like, and that's fair because at the end of the day, like, that's a human emotion that I'm allowed to have about that situation. And any artist is allowed to have about going through that process to write their works. If your if your tears are hitting that paper while you're writing, that's perfectly fine. Like, don't hold back and don't like let yourself feel bad for feeling because that's that's why we suppress things because we feel like we shouldn't feel things. We feel like I'm the bad person and I don't have a right to feel like this. No, 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 that's not how that is at all. You have every right in the world to feel things. I, I believe that we have two kinds of mental health in the world. We have the chemical imbalance mental health that some people are born with and, and, and require medication and, and that's great. And then we've got situational mental health, which is brought on by life experience. And that can only be healed through working through it. And and we would say, well, he's got a chemical imbalance. He's, he's always sad. Well, no. Have you seen his life? I actually think that dude's got a perfectly good balance for what he has gone through. Yeah. You're not damaged. You're not damaged goods. You, you are stuck in the middle of a trauma that you can't seem to work past. And for me, that's the... Getting it out on paper gets me past that trauma. The art therapy, the Play-Doh, the you know, this is what gets me through those through those traumas and allows me to sit back and go, oh, yeah, I'm actually not such a bad guy. Like you know, yeah, we, these things I, all happen for a reason. And yeah, I, I do want to touch on something you said about your ex-wife uh, because that really really resonated with me. Uh, my uh, former, my brother-in-law from a previous marriage, I was really close with him and he was actually going down the, the path of, of, oh, there's the dog. He's going down the path of <laughs> using, using uh, drugs and pills and, um, and same exact thing with you, you said. Uh, and then he, he eventually did overdose and uh, passed away. And I, it, it would took a long time for me to, except that because i was in my head like oh i could have got him help or oh when he was using that one time in my house i was just letting him use and i wasn't telling yeah. him no i mean i wasn't participating but i was i was enabling i was allowing him in yeah. my house and so i had to get to that point where it's like michael he had this issue he had this problem sure you could have improved you could have done better but at the end of the day it ultimately wasn't me who did that and and then these are things that we need to learn going forward um and then just try to become better people and try to not allow that to happen again i guess so that really i i felt that um and, okay so you're talking about spoken word and i know you have a poem we're gonna read so just add another question about uh, are there any like spoken word venues and hey actually you know i've only seen like out here in san diego i've only been to a couple open mic night type things where a few people yeah. will do poetry at them, but most of them, it's not 
there's not very many. Yeah, we, we, we have a group here in Perth, but um, I haven't involved myself with them yet. I'm a bit afraid of clicky groups and stuff, especially with what my works are. So I tend to just, no offence to them, but, you know, for the time being, this is my little bubble and my little world, and I think that's okay to have as well, like my little mm. protection bubble, that's fine. Um, but... I hope that, like, through other other platforms such as, you know, social media, YouTube, things like that, I can, you know, create my own works and get myself out that way. And, you know, I, I don't necessarily right now want to stand in front of an audience. Right. But I have done a lot of YouTube stuff and that in the past and, 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 and internet radio and things like that. So, you know, I can handle doing that. And, and that's my limit for now. Yeah. And, and again, that's acceptable. You know, you, you, you have limits. You have a, you know, I can I can achieve this much today. I got out of bed, made myself a cup of coffee and went back to bed. You're winning. You did something. Don't stress. Right. You know? In online, you do have a slight anonymity to kind of, or this ambiguity where you can kind of put stuff out there and you get to... Uh, go. You only you, you only have to reveal who you are as far as you're comfortable with. Like I know That's some correct. writers, they do a writing handle. Then they they don't even put their name out there. So they other people, exactly. yeah. you know, other people are more in the camera. Like I'm all all in it. Um. So okay, I I'm not totally sure. Trish, so let me try if I could do your question. Um, justice. So having so she said having bipolar has taught her about acceptance and feelings. Um, so has this been your learning experience of, as well um, with acceptance and feelings about, I think about what we're, we're going to, what we're going to get into of, of your acceptance of what's happened and in your past and your feelings about those issues. Okay, I'm not sure I understand. Yeah. Maybe if you could re re ask that question, Trista, uh, uh, cause I, I think, I, I'm a little uh, unclear. Um, kind of, I think accept acceptance of and feelings. So accepting the feelings and learning experience as well. Um. So I don't think my mental oh, health through, through your journey. Okay, so expect your learning, your learning, and accepting your feelings through your journey. Yes, there, very much. So. There you go. Yeah. Um, so I would I, I would say yes in short, um, but only so very recently has that acceptance come into play. Mm. Um, like I am literally talking. This guy who sits in front of you now has only been here for a few months. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, this this you know um, catapulting myself out here doing this. My confidence in being able to do this, all this came from a few good people, well, a couple of good people, because I don't have that, even a few good people in my life anymore. No, I, I drive lots of people around me who, who, who encourage me and like me. They're not necessarily in my immediate life. So in my immediate life, I have a couple of really good people and my art therapy, and those things are what, what has catapulted this now. Right. And and that has been through the, through learning through those people. Um, something Les Les Brown, he's a motivational speaker, says. He says, um, if you cannot find the like, if you can't find the confidence in yourself, if you can't find reason in yourself to believe in yourself, take the belief of other people and use that as your reinforcement, because ultimately. We're our own worst critics. We are going to beat ourselves down a hundred times worse than anybody else. And because of that, we tend to think so very negatively of ourselves while other people around us think the complete opposite of us. They think we're amazing people. Yeah. And yet here we stand twiddling our thumbs going, yeah, but I just don't, I don't understand. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a horrible person. I, no, no so, you will really not. That's so right. That's that. That goes with everything. That goes with personal life, with your who you are as a person. I mean, I think in general, and also with creation and creating art and creating writing or music, whatever you're doing, you're always your worst critic. And getting over yeah. that hump is that once you're able to get over that hump and realize that what you just said, 
then then it's so powerful. Then you can really, really create and, and uh, move on. So speaking of creating and writing, I know you have a piece you wanna you wanna read. I wanna hear it. Let's do that and then we'll we'll cool. get, so, get a little deeper. Yeah. This one's uh, this one's very, very recent. This is um so I've um, I've always struggled with relationships. Um, and that's due to the past traumas and all the rest of it. Um, and and people have uh, often seen me as a mark, a target, someone to be, you know, manipulated and abused. And I know that's going to ring true for many, many people until I come across my current girlfriend who, you know, I'm missing a few teeth. And when she met me, I was living in my car and, uh, you know, scruffy hair and, you know, she adores me just for me. And so I wrote her a couple of poems, and this is one of them. It's called Speechless. I leave her speechless as the words fall away between us. In awe of each other's uniqueness, the feelings that have reached us, like some kind of weakness in this seamless romance, all it took was a glance and I wanted a chance, as she kept me entranced to be in this loving dance, a chance to find a love to abide, as I take her by my side, so if she does decide, then I'll provide to her my loving arms wherever she were. Beautiful. Wow, what an amazing soul that you found. You, you, yeah, we fit each other very well in that in, in that respect. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. And and even more beautiful, you know, you know that you got you got lucky. You got a keeper, and you two are good. Because that's an I, I I did want to mention about the support system that you mentioned. You have a few people that have been really strong support systems, and I think. With obviously your current girlfriend and a few other people that you said you have a few close people. So how important is it to have a few really strong support system or support people in your life when you're going through these things? For other someone else who may not so, have anyone else, what can they do if they don't have anyone? It's like a it's like a prerequisite to hitting on this topic is to mention that we have to heal ourselves just a little bit and at least be able to interact with other people with respect and politeness. And a lot of us who have, who have trauma based, based problems, we find it very hard not to press these onto other people sometimes, you know? Um, and for a very long time, um, I actually had no one at all. Um, from when my ex fiance tried to commit suicide, her family already didn't like me, and that so that broke final like that was sort of the final straw, and it didn't take long about 12 months, and that completely completely dissolved. And I went driving, I just packed my car and started traveling around Australia. And uh, halfway across the Nullarbor, which is an incredible drive and some, some of the most beautiful scenery you'll come across, I wasn't enjoying it because I was alone. And I actually knew just how alone I was. My father had passed away. My mother and sister were both like uh, narcissistic and, and very cruel to me growing up. So there was no family relationship there. Um, my cousins had done some bad things in the family. So that wasn't an acceptable, you know, group of people to have around me. And, and, Looking back, what I did was I removed all the bad people from my life, but it left me lonely. You know, I was completely and utterly alone. And that that sort of the hit of rock bottom where I went, well, I've now got to look at how I deal with people. And so I started to create this cycle of overly people-pleasing, dangerous people. And that was even worse. Yes. So people people do that and it's and it's a subconscious reaction because they just want to be loved. Everyone wants to be loved. And you I, all deserve I have that to be issue, loved. the people pleasing, and it's so hard. It some 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 You all deserve you love, hey, but this is this is what I've this is what I've come come to learn through. Um, I have a lady who decided that she wanted to be my mum. And Maxine, and I call her Ma. She's uh she's one, 
and, and I got my partner and these people, and this is what you have to find. They love me for me. No strings attached. I don't have to please them. I can be, I can sit, I sat there six months ago discussing with Ma that the silence in my head was there. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. oh, oh, I, I decided that life was so bad that it wasn't going to change. And this was the cycle and I couldn't break it. So we sat there and we just kind of said, you know, look, for me, like, you know, I say, like, People, if, if someone's not enjoying their job or, you know, an activity that they're doing, we don't force them to continue, yeah. you know. So here I am, I'm like, I don't want to continue. I don't want to continue life. And we had a heart-to-heart -heart and she was accepting of my choice if it's what I wanted, but did also say, you know, shit, I, I, I miss you a lot if you went, though. Yes. And, yeah. you know, that, that, that conversation was a bit of a turning point in its own, as along with some other conversations around about the same time. But it was that acceptance. It didn't matter that I was that broken. It didn't become something she took offence to. She wasn't angry with me for that, which you would recognise and I'm sure other people recognise so many people have an expectation upon you and they'll take offense to your bad day. They're not your people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Get rid of them. Upgrade your friends, upgrade the people. And if you have to go to that battle loneliness like I did, it's okay. There's, there's light on the other side. You, you just have to, you just have to work hard at who you are and how you express yourself so that you're not putting these things on other people. You can have discussions with them, but it's not their, you're not making it their problem. And they need to be the kind of people who just love you for you. Warts and all, no strings attached, unconditional love, as we've all heard the phrase, but most of us, most of us haven't found yet. And I, I have, thankfully, and, and I hope that doesn't dig in deep on anyone who hasn't. But I have, and I'm, and I'm very, very lucky for that, and I recognise that I have, and I have to hold on to that, and it doesn't matter how much work it takes in myself or what I have to do, that I must maintain those relationships. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Unless they ever break down and turn negative and they, you know, all of a sudden a string was to be attached, then, then, then the world changes. But those no-strings-attached relationships... They're the ones you want. They're the people you want around you. Yeah. It's loving people where they're at, whether the good, the exactly. bad, the ugly, where, where they're at. You love them. Seeing who's inside and knowing that that's just a layer of pain. Right. Yeah. Just, you know? I it has a great point. And she said it takes one friend to spark hope. And it kind of sounds like that. that's kind of your journey. You had... You know, I, I don't know who came first. Uh, your the ma, not your original ma. Your, your ma, your new one, or uh, adopted ma, I guess you could say. Or yeah, ex. Yeah. I don't know who came, or your your current wife or current girlfriend. I don't it know. was it, it was ma. And then so she was like Trissa. She was that one friend who kind of sparked hope in you, and yeah, and you blossomed from that. And and you're exactly. a stronger, yep. stronger person. Now the order was the order was Ma, art therapy, writing all my poetry, letting my current partner read it when we first met, because we can't share our life story in one day, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a page full of poetry to share your life with, I tell you what, I think that that was a big a big bonus because all of a sudden she just went, "Wow, look at this guy." I can see the depth of him. I can see who he really is underneath all of that pain yeah. and that life that he's currently in. It doesn't, you know, I'm not a bad person. I've, I've been through a lot of shit and, I, and I'm stuck in my car and, you know, but that's not who I aspire to be. Something I used to always say is it doesn't matter who you were yesterday. It matters who you choose to be today and who you aspire to be tomorrow. Yes. I love that. I love that. You're, 
you're not controlled by your past or you it's always exactly. a new day a hundred percent like like so many people believe that uh you know, your past is, 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 is a cement weight on your legs. Like, you, you are stuck in that cycle because of your past. But, and I know that this is confronting, but the truth really is you're in control of today. Yes, that trauma happened. Yes, that past happened. But you can choose to change things today. And you can choose to live a different life today and move forward with a different life. As hard as it can be in the initial stages, you have that choice. It is something you can reach down inside you and change. Yeah. And like you illustrated, which I think is beautiful. I love how you did the little timeline because you kind of talked about all these characters in your life. And then you, you straight said, ma, uh, art therapy, writing my art, and then my current girlfriend. And that's your your soulmate your twin flame whatever you want to call it she's your she's your your rock it sounds like it, i i can yeah. feel it i can feel it in your conviction and so a lot of people they they want to skip from having nothing all the way into going straight into having yeah, everything yeah. yeah you it's a slow process it's a slow Rome wasn't built in a day yes but it was pretty much destroyed in one so that you know you're, oh, you're right. Yeah, Always you're right. important to remember that, you know, you can build yourself up and you can have a hundred great things happen. And this is where it's so important to who you keep around because it only takes one jackass to mess up something for you and bring that whole world crumbling down for you in that instant. Mm -hmm. And you're like, where am I at? What am I doing? Like, it's, you know, despair kicks back in and, and, and here you are. You just, you're lost again, you know, until you can find that and reach down inside you and be like, no pull out that happiness again and that and, and that motivation and that drive and go for it again you know it's yeah so let's we're we i i do want to we're, we're i don't want to get too too deep but let's rewind a little bit and kind of go into some of the we won't get too heavy into it but some of your past and and what what was it that really what was it that made you break the cycle because because you're saying you were in these, you know, some really bad stuff happened through your life and you're in your car and that we, your mom wasn't supporting you. But what was it really that kind of broke that cycle to get out of a lot of that previous trauma? Me. Okay. My, my realization of how alone I'd become in the middle of the middle of the uh, middle of another bar as I was crossing it. And uh, from there, the next sort of trigger point would have been um, having that realization and knowing I needed better people around me and then immersing myself yet again into bad people and over people pleasing with those people. Um, I realized again, I needed to break away from that. I, I came to Perth um, from a, from a country town down the coast um, where I first first moved to when I got when I got to Western Australia, I lived in a lived in a town called Bunbury, which um, is like the meth capital of of Western Australia. Uh, it's like a fifty three percent meth rate, and as you can see, I, I like I didn't get treated very well down there. This is I've always been this 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 lovable character to the most point, but looking at me in a town like that really brought me down because. People would look at me like, you're just another one of them 50, 53%, you know. Um, so I ended up moving up to Perth and I started a handyman business. All right, let's see how tools my money. Uh, <laughs> I took my, took my artistic abilities and my mechanical mind and I put it to use. After being sick for so many years, so I, I actually uh, – a little while ago, we discovered I'd had a parasite living in my brain for my whole life. Wow. And that's what was causing the disparity and, and a lot of my mental health issues. Wow. And we cleared that up and I literally woke up one morning with my mental health cured. And, and, and I know that sucks for a lot of people because most people aren't going to have that opportunity. And I'm extremely lucky for that. But even prior to that, sick and unwell, all the mental health on top of me, I started my handyman business. I I would start it off. <laughs> You're right, bro. No, no, that was <laughs> I started. 
Sorry, so I have records and they fall off my roof. So sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I I came up to Perth and I realised that I needed to do something to fulfil me, and so I, I've got a basic understanding of, of of a lot of crafts back then, and and I I had grown up being a a, a trainee painter in my younger years, and so I I, I, had, I had a few little skills under my belt, and I took those and just just my artistic ability and said I'm going to try and be a handyman. So I started hanging pictures and curtain frames and fixing patches of patches on walls and things like that. And that has now grown into a business. I have uh, 500 customers on a like on my books. Um, they have. Um, they're all repeat customers. I've, I've got a whole thing to look back on and go, wow, I've built something that is mine. Yeah. I've done it. I am worthy. Right. But even then, I still sat down and went, but I'm not worthy. I haven't done enough. I don't own a house. I've got a shitty car. I, I'm, I'm still messed up in the head. Um, 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 I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And that's where I refer to just the last couple of months being such a big launch because it really did. Even after I created all of that for myself, I still needed those people to come in and reinforce, no, you've done really good. Look around you. Look at other people around you. Like that 53%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, I, I'm doing I, I, something. I had no idea about your small business. I'm like, I'm on a kick all about that. That is, that is amazing. I'm all about people. If you're not happy in your job, like, you know, create one and do what you love and that, and now you have all these skills. So we are kind of got to wrap up here. Um, but before I, I want to have you read another poem or something uh, on our way out. And oh, then... I didn't prepare another one. Oh, you don't have? Okay, well, well it's okay. We'll no. talk about your socials. But I have a question, another question for Patricia. This is this is a great, a great question to kind of uh, wrap up the main part of the interview. Uh, so, and I think this is so poignant for everyone who's gone through hard and difficult things in their life. So knowing who you are right now you said you're in a great place you have an amazing partner you have an amazing uh, support system and everything's all in place that's great so would you change your past knowing how hard it no. was, knowing who you are no way no way because that past created all the empathy and all the understanding that i have now that i'm also my partner's rock because she's been through absolute hell and back and yeah no mm -hmm. no i would not take a single thing back even including the, the the worst of the worst like being molested and stuff no i would not take any of it back yeah it was damn hard and yeah the easy road is to say yeah i would take all that back but you know what i think i'd be a bit of an asshole right i don't think i'd be a nice guy yes i do yes i i 100% I think that is the most beautiful life outlook and it's kind of those things and all those stuff that happen is what created who you are now and exactly. you are so strong right now and in a good place who knows what you'd be if you didn't go through those so exactly yep. yeah yeah Oh, that's beautiful, man. I really like that. And you know what? I, I'm, I'm so, I'm really happy we were able to have this conversation and we got a little deep and um, it, this 50 minutes always goes so fast. Every time I ever do these, it's like, all, I'm like blinking. I'm like looking at the time. I'm like, oh man, it's already over. Um, But thanks for coming on. I'm sure if, if you want to come back on and talk more in the future, we yeah, can always we'll, do for that. Yeah, for sure, man. We'll do, we'll do more. But before you go, um, obviously, I'm going to keep this up. I'm going to tag you in it. Uh, so if anyone wants to follow you, definitely go go follow. Check out your art and, ever, and your poetry and everything. Get pictures of the dog and the family. And you get kind of, you do kind of do your life story on your page, which I love. But can you share again that Facebook group? And what is it called if anyone is interested in that? Yeah, it's the uh, Facebook Poetry Society. Yeah. Cool. So you just search pa Facebook Poetry Society and then it's a exactly. cool yep. 
go and join the group. Cool. And you're For a moderator sure. on there. So like I am, yeah. Nice. Man. Yep. Earned, that, earned that little title. Oh, I was quite proud of myself that day. I went in and told them how I just finished my uh my art therapy and, and how we were all talking about the specifics. You know, of uh, I, I had to you know, learn to love myself and accept myself. And, you know, here I was, like, as soon as that happened, and I went, oh, someone like this whole group thinks I'm good enough to become a big part of this. And I, like, I really, really enjoyed being in that group in the first place. So it was like being welcomed into a family. And I was like, Whoa. a community. It's so yeah. important to have those communities. And for sure. So, yeah. So, like, so, and I have to say, I and it, you, it's the first that anyone's gotten so dressed up for the interview. So I have to say, you no. are dapper. Oh, dapper right? I love that. <laughs> you are, I, you, that's the first. And possibly might be the last that someone dressed up so <laughs> fancy for the interview. So I do have to give you, you get the award on that for the uh, the, the most uh, professionally dressed on, the, on uh, the art pop interviews that we've had so far. <laughs> So, and hey, I really Dude, Mike, appreciate, I appreciate that. Yeah, and I really appreciate you coming on here, doing this interview, um, and being so open and vulnerable. That's so important. Um, man, no, my pleasure, man. My pleasure. The one thing I've learned from my poetry and the comments I get about my poetry is that apparently my words help people. Yes. And if you recognize that look on my face when I say that, that's what I'm talking about. Like, we don't always recognize our inner strengths. You have to listen to other people. You listen to the other positive people, rather, around you to hear who you are. Oh, yeah. Don't listen in here. This thing's full of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, and have that all right. and build that. We're all system. worthy. Yeah. Well, hey, Klaus. Cultus. Cultus. Oh, damn. I went the whole <laughs> time without brutalizing it. And then I, I, sh I, and then I was going to try. And I, of course, I just did. I had to. So, Cultus. So, my partner still gets it wrong, bro. I don't feel bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks, so, going, going. <laughs> thanks so much for joining us from the future. Because you're like, yeah, mate. you're a whole day ahead. So, <laughs> yeah, it's um, uh, like nine o'clock. Oh, is it? Yeah, nearly nine o'clock in the morning. On the Monday. Yeah, so okay, cool. Yeah. So, so Monday we're still we're still good. Okay, so I I, I know the future's good, right? Because you're yeah yeah yeah. The sun the sun came up, bro. It's okay. Okay, cool. All right, so I know the sun's gonna come up on my tomorrow Monday because <laughs> you know you're in the future. I'll message you the sun for the minute if it changes. <laughs> that was one of the fun parts. Like, okay, we gotta coordinate the time, and that's always weird. <laughs> I'm only usually doing East Coast West Coast. So I was like, ooh, this is a whole nother level with the audience. yeah. <laughs> So I love that we were able to coordinate this time and do this interview. Thanks so much for joining and uh, keep in touch. And if you have any um, book or any poetry or anything you want to come on and promote in the future, hit me up and we'll, uh, we'll have you back on. And I, I would love to talk more and get even deeper because I know there's so much that we didn't really cover on too. For sure. Yeah, I'm up for that, man. Awesome. Sounds great. Yeah, and I'm going to keep this up for about about 18 hours to a day. So if any stragglers want to come in at the last minute, that um, they can come and watch and everything. But uh, definitely keep creating your art, man. And I I, oh, I, I feel so uplifted after this uh, after this conversation. It was really a beautiful, beautiful conversation. Good, I'm glad. Yeah, no, definitely. That's what I did get, apparently. Yeah, and Trista said great talk, and she's uh, she really she can relate to a lot of what you said and, and appreciate it. Too, so. I appreciate everyone in the comments as well. Yeah, oh, for sure, definitely it's been well, great. Yeah, have a great one and uh, down under, and we'll we'll talk again. We'll keep in touch. All right, mate. Peace out.